Hey everybody, welcome back. This 1113 installment was one I really hadn't intended on making, but uh, it's about time to catch you guys up on what the future of this project is. And uh, there was a couple pretty good questions asked in the comment section under the last video where I assembled the compression release for this engine about how that thing works. And I figured it'd be just as easy to make a response video as it would be to try typing all that out in the comments section below. So 1113 is sitting here. You can see I've been, uh, getting some of the head studs cleaned. None of these are installed. They're all just, just sitting in there, but got a good set of those. All been worked over, nice threads, ready to do the installation on those. And 1113's old cylinder head is sitting here too. You can tell by the gigantic hole that was pushed out by all the freezing that was going on. I'll use this to kind of explain how that uh, compression release system works, why they use the intake valves, and why some of the potential problems that could result from that weren't really problems. So let's get into it. So probably the two most frequently asked questions in the comment section below my last video were, are you sure they use the intake valves to decompress the engine and not the exhaust like other manufacturers do? And if so, why? Well, we'll look at the D3400 engine manual right here. Under valve lifters, Cutting right to the chase, those non-adjustable compression release mechanisms that we saw in the last video included in each assembly act on the inlet valve lifter to hold the valve in an open position. And CAT used the intake valves uh, to decompress these engines in the 1930s, 1940s, and I know for a fact in the 1950s because my 1951 5U D2 that has a D311 engine in it also hangs the intake valves open to decompress it. But as for why they chose the intakes, not the exhaust, I really didn't know. So I asked that question on the ACMOC bulletin board. That stands for Antique Caterpillar Machinery Owners Club. Go check them out. Great site, great club. Any of this, if you're into any of this Caterpillar stuff, that is the place to be. And there's more knowledge on that board probably than anywhere else. And sure enough, uh, it did not disappoint me. Um, one Mr. EDB from Victoria, Australia chimed in with the answer. Now, EDB is probably... Well, he's an international treasure when it comes to knowledge about these old Caterpillars. He apprenticed on these engines, uh, spent decades in the dealership working on them, worked in the engine shop, did the fuel injection stuff. I mean, this guy has forgotten more about these, these engines than I'll ever know. And I mean, like I said, decades of real world experience. So he writes, a good question. I once asked that question at the dealer in the early days of working in the engine rebuild shop as an apprentice, and I was told it was because you can have loose soot, water, and other crud in the exhaust pipe slash manifold. The exhaust system is basically unfiltered air that water can sometimes get down the pipe too, and some of that crud would get drawn into and out of each cylinder via the dirty exhaust system. Whereas utilizing the inlet system, the air transferred in and out of the cylinders and would essentially be clean. Or words to that effect. Cheers, Eddie B. And like I say, Eddie, you are an international treasure. Thank you, sir. Um, you know, that's just, that's real world, real world stuff there. And when Eddie talks, eh, it's pretty much gospel. So um, again, ACMOC, it's, if you wanna know about these old cats, click onto that site, support the club, join up. It's a really, really good thing. Another theory that was floated in the comment section about why they would choose to use the intake valves for decompression rather than the exhaust was to better utilize the exhaust heat coming from a starting engine, which is true. Although with an asterisk, not yet on this particular D3400. Um, granted at the time 1113 was built, they were already utilizing the heated pony exhaust pipe that ran through the intake manifold on the larger diesels with the upright uh, starting engines like my RD6. I mean, they were already doing that to help draw some of that exhaust heat off that pipe and run it in through the cylinders to aid in the preheating process. Now, when 1113 was built, for some reason, they just ran that starting engine exhaust pipe straight out into the atmosphere, didn't utilize it in the intake at all. It actually took a couple model years of the D2s before they started running that pony exhaust pipe pass passage through the intake for the diesel engine. Why they didn't do that earlier on these D3400s, I've never really understood because these are such a small bore little diesel engine anyway. It's going to take a lot more time for these small pistons and small cylinders to heat up the block, the liners, all the surrounding material just from the heat from compression 
I mean, it's good. It's going to take these a lot longer than most other larger bore engines. Of course, maybe they thought, you know, like those big five and three quarter inch bore eight inch stroke diesels had more mass to heat up. So they figured they'd utilize the heat coming from that starting engine pipe and thought they needed it. Whereas maybe this was small enough they could get by without it. At any rate, a couple years into the run, they did start utilizing that exhaust heat. So that is another benefit to using the intake valves, you know, to keep them hung open so that basically you are introducing and keeping more of that warm air around the cylinders during your initial cranking period. Like I said, just not quite yet for this particular engine. Another interesting comment I want to touch on was, I believe left by BC Block 2 asking if they hold the intake valves open to decompress the engine when you're cranking this thing, wouldn't that tend to want to push air out of the cylinders and back through the oil bath air cleaner? Well, that's honestly, in practice, never been a problem that I've ever ran into. Uh, so I threw 1113's cylinder head here on this little bench to kind of explain what my theory on this is. Now, this is only my theory. I can't prove it, but here's here's my take on that. Um, first port, middle port, and rear port are all exhaust, so you just have this port here and this port here for intake. And you can see that is a very cavernous intake passage. So this intake port feeds this cylinder and this cylinder. This intake port feeds the other two. So that means this valve here and this valve here are both connected to that common passage. And if I shine a light in there, again, you can see how there is a lot of room. We'll shine a light in this other one. Quite the large area in there. So since we have number one piston and number four going up and down in unison, and then two and three going up and down in unison, that means that the one intake port that feeds one and two Basically, you're going to have intake valves hung open on both these cylinders, and my theory here is as one piston is coming up, it's able to swirl that air that is pushing back out, while the other piston that is connected to that same passage is going down. I'm believing that the cylinder that's going down is scavenging some of that air that's being pushed out of the cylinder that's coming up, and you're just kind of getting a transfer effect to some extent between those two cylinders and then between the back two. Like I said, that's just a theory. I can't prove it, but you know, in practice, it's it's never been a problem. I've never had any one of these machines ever have any tendency at all pushing any of that air back through the intake. But that was kind of a good question that made me think on that a little bit. And now for the other thing I want to touch on in this video, basically what the forecast, if you will, for this project is or what to expect in the future. I was kind of sparked to do this because I've had several different people ask if I'm also going to show the rebuild process of the starting engine. And I absolutely, yes, I absolutely have to rebuild that engine. If you look at 1113's original cylinder head, how it froze and, and cracked and heaved this piece out and a big crack is here and another crack goes all the way down next to those valve guide bores. 1113 starting engine block fared even worse than that cylinder head. And it's kind of the same story as with the diesel engine. The block casting was destroyed, but most of the in internal components are in very, very good condition. So yes, I'm gonna be doing a full starting engine rebuild on this, but wait, as they say, there's more. Follow me outside. So I came out here and I dug 1113's back end out of the snowbank. What I don't do for you guys, I tell you. <laughs> anyway, um, you know, when we pulled this, engine off of course we found this machine and this uh this main cover for the clutch had been left off so that was wide open for who knows how long and it really caused some nasty corrosion issues in there the uh, clutch disc is all swelled up and you can see it was so rusted into the flywheel that it ripped half the teeth right off of it everything in there is seized so that's going to require some pretty pretty heavy rehab in there so we'll have the bell housing pretty much opened right up here and if you also remember when we first brought this home we had some sticking uh, steering clutches you can click right about here right about now go relive that whole experience if you would choose but well just so far everything's feeling pretty good in there not the best to travel but there is spring back so I'm, I'm betting nothing is stuck in there again but after one of these has had either one of these those steering clutches in there stick you might as well pop the final drives off, get in there, make sure all that stuff's right. You're bound to find some bad seals. You might find some bad bearings. I know the clutch packs need help. So to do that, 
you're taking the tracks and the track frames off each side. You're taking both final drives off. So by that point, we're gonna be left with a transmission assembly that already has the whole bell housing open, both final drives off, final drives laying there just begging for something. You might as well crack into the transmission, crack into both final drives, clean that stuff, inspect it, rebearing where needed, reseal where needed, put it all back together. As long as the track frames are off, you might as well flip them upside down, make sure you don't have any bottom roller problems. Long story short, guys, you're going to see every single piece of 1113 probably on the bench at one point before we're considering this whole thing done. So yes, lots and lots and lots of videos left to come in the future. So hopefully that gives you guys some insight into kind of where I am with this project and you can rest assured you're gonna have 1113 content to watch for a long, long, long time yet. Um, I mean, I'm not really very far into it, you know, when you take into account all all aspects of the job, but still need to get the uh, nuts and washers cleaned up, inspected, threads chased, get a good set for all these head studs here. We'll start working over a cylinder head next. I have a couple more in addition to this one. I'm writing 1113's original cylinder head casting off. It's just too badly damaged to mess with. I am going to try and salvage the pre-combustion chambers out of there, see if they're any good. But, you know, long story short, there's a long ways left to go on this project. So I hope you guys stick around for it. As always, thank you for watching. I gotta get busy. <laughs>